I'd like to tell you about the brutal and senseless murder of a young woman, an ex-model and a new mother who is named Rachel Nickell, who was tragically murdered at the age of 23 on Wimbledon Common in South West London in July 1992. So consider this your trigger warning because this really is a gruesome case. Now the reason I picked this particular case is twofold. Firstly, I remember me and my peers being specifically taught about it during our training as baby forensic psychiatry registrars before we blossomed into full-blown consultants. And the reason that we were taught about this notorious case is that it had a big impact on the landscape of forensic mental health forever, particularly criminal profiling. And I will divulge exactly how this happened later on in this episode. And the second reason is that when I tell people that I'm a forensic psychiatrist, they frequently assume that my job has something to do with criminal profiling. In fact, even since starting this podcast, which was, you know, less than a month ago, I've been approached by a couple of other pod makers asking my opinions on some profiling on previous specific cases. But just to be clear, forensic psychiatry has absolutely nothing to do with criminal profiling or solving crimes in any shape or form. And at the end of this episode, I'll tell you a bit about what forensic psychiatrists like myself actually do. Now, back to the murder. This really was a horrific and brutal murder and it seemed completely random. Basically, it's your worst nightmare. Unprovoked, unpredictable and in a fairly affluent area of London as well. So Rachel was walking with her two-year-old son, who was almost three, through a secluded area in Wimbledon Common one morning. She was repeatedly stabbed and slashed with a knife and then she was sexually assaulted. And then the perpetrator fled to the scene, leaving the two-year-old son, thankfully, physically unharmed. And then a passerby found the little boy clinging to his mother's body, repeating the words, wake up mummy, wake up mummy. So this really is just such a tragedy. Even talking about it with my calloused, weathered, forensic psychiatrist heart after assessing hundreds of defendants and dissecting many heinous crimes, I can't help but feel desperately bad for that poor little boy. I actually remember when I was taught about this case, I wondered whether that two-year-old boy would have remembered the event. In fact, I even asked the lecturer and he mumbled some non-committal answer, probably not, I think is what he said. But I've since researched it and I have an answer for you, sort of, later in this podcast. So after this happened, the Met Police carried out a very large investigation and as you can imagine, this attracted a lot of media attention. One of their main culprits was a man named Colin Stagg an unemployed man from Roehampton who frequently walked his dog in that particular area. So the police asked a criminal psychologist to create an offender profile of the killer. And they decided that this man, Stag, fitted the profile and they asked the psychologist to assist in designing a covert operation which was, in effect, a honey trap. And this was named Operation Esdell. And the objective was to get Stag to implicate himself in the murder. So an undercover policewoman contacted Stag, posing as a friend of somebody he knew. And over the space of about five months, she feigned a romance with him. So she would meet with him, speak with him on the phone, and they would exchange letters containing like sexual fantasies. And then during a meeting once in Hyde Park, the undercover police officer tried to coax a confession uh, out of Stag for the murder of Rachel Nickell. And the undercover female police officer drew out some violent fantasies from Stag, but he did not admit to the murder. And she actually recorded their conversation, and I'll relay a couple of clips, uh, a couple of clips from the transcript. So the police officer said that she enjoyed hurting people, and then Stag replied, "Please explain, as I live a quiet life. If I, if I've disappointed you, please don't dump me. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before." Then the police officer replied saying, if only you'd done the Wimbledon common murder, if only you'd killed her, it would be all right. And then Stag replied saying, I'm terribly sorry, but I didn't do it. I mean, come on, let's face it, that is a barefaced, outrageous, obvious entrapment. 
The Crown Prosecution Service staggeringly felt that there was significant evidence to convict Stagg for Rachel Nichols murder. And so they arrested him and then they charged him in August 1993. So Stagg ended up on remand in prison for 14 months. And after all of that, the case finally reached the Old Bailey. So for our American brethren, the Old Bailey is the most famous criminal court in the UK. It's also known as the Central Criminal Court. And it's a pretty kind of grand and intimidating building that even to this day gives me goose goosebumps when I give evidence there. The judge said that the police had tried to uh, incriminate the suspect by deceptive conduct of the grossest kind, his words. He threw the case out and Stagg was formally acquitted in September 1994. Now what's remarkable was that actually they found a small amount of DNA on Rachel's body but at that time, the technology wasn't strong enough to make a match. However, the DNA techniques eventually caught up and in 2004, it was linked to a man named Robert Napper. In 2006, Scotland Yard interviewed Napper, who was a convicted murderer. And at the time, he was a patient in Broadmoor Hospital, which is a notorious high secure hospital. Uh, I've worked there in the past, again, as a baby registrar around the time I learned about this case, in fact. So Napper had a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia and also Asperger's syndrome. He'd been convicted of the murder of another young woman called Samantha Bissett and disgustedly her four-year-old daughter as well in November 1993, which was about 16 months after Nikel's murder. So obviously his modus operandi is kind of consistent. What's even more weird and slightly creepy is that when they searched his house, they found like this map and where he'd circled the places where he'd committed serious offences. And sure enough, the map had the exact spot in Wimbledon Common marked out where he'd left that horrific scene, the dead body of Rachel Nickel and that poor little boy. And there was even a shoe print that was found near the scene, which matched one of Robert Napper's shoes and also some red paint from a box that he'd owned, which was found at his house. So actually, the evidence was, it was quite overwhelming. Napper initially denied the offence, and then later, in December 2008, he pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of Rachel Nickel on the grounds of diminished responsibility. So diminished responsibility is a partial psychiatric offence, which downgrades murder to manslaughter. It's decided by a judge on the evidence of a forensic psychiatrist such as myself. Obviously, I wasn't involved in this particular case. I'm not that old. And what it does is it downgrades murder to manslaughter. I'd love to teach you about diminished responsibility in a future podcast. Very briefly, murder in the UK results in a mandatory life sentence. The sentence for manslaughter, however, is at the discretion of the judge. And it, at one end of the spectrum, the judge um, would release the defendant with no sentence. And I've seen this usually in the context of victims of, of domestic violent cases who lashed out and killed their abusive partners. And then on the other end of the spectrum would be life sentence. Now I've actually been asked in the past why some prisoners with life sentences get to leave jail. And in England and Wales, life imprisonment doesn't mean life behind bars. Although in very serious cases it can if the judge disposes what's called a whole life order. What life sentence means that is that the defendant goes to prison for a minimum term, which was previously known as a tariff. So for murder, this is usually 15 to 20 years and then is eligible for parole. And then they're, they're on parole, not in prison for the rest of their life. On parole, on parole means you are under supervision by a probation officer, now known as an offender manager. The system loves changing its names up, doesn't it? So you have to meet certain conditions such as unpaid work or treatment for an addiction. And if you break any of the rules or commit a crime during your probation period, then you can go to court and potentially back to prison. So back to the case of Napa. Napper, who was 42 at the time, brought terror to South London. He's been convicted of two murders, one manslaughter, two rapes and two attempted rapes. And he went to Broadmoor Hospital in 1995 and he's still there to this day. And to give you an idea of his psyche and his mental state during the trial at the Old Bailey regarding Rachel Nickell's killing, 
he actually stated that he believed he had a master's degree in maths, that he'd won a Nobel Peace Prize, that he'd been awarded medals for fighting, and he believed that his fingers had been blown off by an IRA parcel bomb but had miraculously uh, grown back. So the outcome of that case would be that Napa was continued to be detained at Broadmoor Hospital indefinitely, and the judge called him a very dangerous man. In fact, Napa would have been there at Broadmoor whilst I was working there. But it's, it's a very large hospital with many wards, so staff typically don't meet all the patients or necessarily know who's there at any one time. At the same time, Colin Stagg received a public apology from the Met Police. And then there was an internal review, and this revealed that around £3 million of the public's money had been used to set up the honey trap. And then Stagg sued the police for damages of £1 million due to the 14 months that he spent in custody. Now, obviously, this is speculation, but from my experience of working in prisons, I'm certain that his time would have been horrendous. Rapists are targeted and assaulted in prison, and especially considering the nature of this offence and that it was so high profile, you know, the random rape of and murder of a young woman in front of her two-year-old son. And the prison thuggery judiciary isn't as honourable as, or as fair as the British system. And I'm pretty sure the other prisoners handing out their own form of justice wouldn't have lived by the credence innocent until proven guilty. Stagg actually later co-wrote and published a couple of books. And then the female undercover officer took early retirement and then she herself sued the Met Police for damages arising from her part in the investigation. And she received £125,000 for that. Is that fair? I'm sure you might have your own opinions on that. But of this whole fiasco, the bit that's most relevant for the field of forensic mental health and for me and my colleagues was this. The criminal psychologist who carried out the offender profiling was charged with professional misconduct by the British Psychological Society in 2002 although I should say that the case was dismissed. I have thought carefully about whether to actually name him on this podcast. And even though what I, th I think what he did was a bit of a slap in the face for forensic mental health, I don't think I'm going to name him because that's a bit of a snake move and I'm not a snake. However, if you were so inclined, it's not particularly hard uh, to find his name on the internet. And he's even featured on a clip that I'm going to mention in a couple of minutes. I would point out that the psychologist himself, uh, he shirked responsibility. He said that he was merely advising the police and that it was up to them what they did with the information. But then he reportedly designed the actual sting operation. So I ain't buying it. I'd also point out that he has made a career out of his supposed mystical skill, having released several books before and even after the case of Rachel Nickell. Is that fair? I'm sure you might have your own opinions on that, and I probably agree with you. So the Independent Police Complaints Commission, the IPCC, released a very critical report in June 2010 that criticised the Metropolitan's police uh, for their actions. It said that the police missed a series of opportunities to find the right culprit, which was Napa, and they made a catastrophic but very good point. They suggested that Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter would have been saved, would have been alive now if the police had followed the evidence and had not been misguided by this criminal profiling. They actually had tip-offs, including one, and this shocked me the most, from Napa's own mother. Apparently Napa had told his own mother that he'd raped a woman and she called the police and told them. But amazingly, they eliminated him from the investigation because he didn't fit the physical profile because he was like over six foot tall. If you're interested, and if you've made it this far into my podcast, then I presume you are, there's a YouTube clip from Sky News which outlines the police's mishandling of this case in detail. The link for this video is below. So offender profiling, what the dealio, I hear you ask. And I hate to urinate on anyone's parade, and even though in media and in film we have these famous characters like in Silence of the Lambs and in Crackers who work with the police and who claim they can create like a, uh, an offender profile which can help solve crimes and catch the slippery culprit 
he's a very narcissistic man who works in finance. Or she's in her 40s, lives alone and has an innate fear of badgers. It's actually not a scientific procedure. It reminds me of uh, Mind Hunters on Netflix, which I personally enjoyed, but it's really it's important to understand that it's just entertainment, folks. I also enjoyed Cobra Kai, but I wouldn't wax numerous cars and paint fences to learn how to fight. Psychological profiling is a method of identifying suspects by looking at a person's mental, emotional and personality characters. And it's based on the way they have committed certain previous crimes or acts uh, and what they've left at previous crime scenes. But all offender profiling is theoretical. It's all subjective and the personal opinion of one particular psychologist. There's no actual scientific proof that any of it is actually effective and there's no studies to show this. The reason why it's a flawed pseudoscience is because it relies on two particular assumptions behavioural consistency within and between offenders. This is the idea that an offender's crime follows a predictable pattern and also that one offender's behaviours tends to be similar to another. Malcolm Gladwell, who you might have heard of, he's like a media psychologist and I dig some of his work, compared offender profiling to astrology. Shout out to Malcolm. Clearly, some offences do follow demographic patterns. Off the top of my head, obvious examples would be that perpetrators of sexual abuse will often abuse themselves. Um, people who witness violence in their childhood and adolescence are more likely to be violent themselves. Far more men than women commit rape. Drug addicts are more likely to commit burglary and robbery. Um, youths in certain areas of South London are more likely to carry knives. Um, Bearded brown men have committed more terrorist atrocities than some other demographics. Uh, not me though, I'm cool. But this is hardly groundbreaking or cutting edge science, right? It's obvious and there's not enough specifics to build a profile of any one individual. And as I've learned from my own experience of assessing crimes perpetrated by people with mental illness, people can be unpredictable, especially if they have symptoms of florid psychosis. So some people might fit a particular profile, but there's always exceptions. For example, most perpetrators of violence are males in their teens or 20s, but I've personally assessed more than one woman in her 60s who's been remanded in prison due to fairly severe violence. Also, criminal profiling is unregulated. There's no government body which determines who and who is not qualified to be a profiler, so anybody can call themselves a criminal profiler. There's no grueling training and assessments and qualifications like the stuff I had to do to become a forensic psychiatrist. Not that I'm bitter, I love relentless exams. I'll give you an example of a once well-established sham theory related to criminal profiling that you might have heard of. So the McDonnell triad refers to the idea that, that there are three signs that can indicate when whether somebody will grow up to be a serial killer or commit other kinds of violent criminal acts. And these are being cruel or abusive to animals, especially pets, setting fires to objects or minor acts of arson and regularly wetting the bed to teenage years. And this idea first gained uh, momentum when a researcher who was a psychiatrist named J.M. MacDonald published a controversial review in 1963 of some earlier studies and he suggested this link. MacDonald believed that cruelty to animals stemmed from children being humiliated by others such as older adults or authoritative uh, adults who the children couldn't retaliate against so the kids instead acted out their frustrations on animals to you know, vent their anger. And McDonald suggested setting fires for similar reasons. And he also postulated that children wet the bed, known as enuresis. We doctors love spicing things up with a bit of Latin. And this was like linked to helplessness, stress and anxiety. I mean, to me, it does sound like a viable theory, but is it accurate? I think it's worth noting that MacDonald himself thought that the link was tenuous. But that didn't stop researchers from seeking to validate a connection between the MacDonald triad and violent behaviour 
I guess you could say that old MacDonald had some charm. E-I-E-I-O. Extensive research has been done to validate McDonald's claims that these behaviours could predict violent behaviour in adulthood. And a few studies in the 60s supported the theory, but then again, more recent, more robust research did not. Researchers suggested that the triad was more reliable as a tool to indicate that a child had a dysfunctional home environment. But, I mean, that's obvious, right? You don't need to be a psychologist or researcher to postulate that torturing animals and setting fires might reflect that everything's not quite cushy at home. It's hardly helpful for profiling. Basically, it's nearly impossible to claim that certain behaviours or environmental factors can be directly linked to violent or murderous behaviour. But after decades of research, some predictors of violence have been suggested as somewhat common patterns in those who commit violence or murder as adults. This is especially true when it comes to people who exhibit traits of antisocial personality disorder, which is commonly known as sociopathy. Now, I've talked about this disorder earlier uh, in episode five, where I talk about personality disorders. Uh, I also talk about borderline personality disorder, so please go check it out. But just to refresh your memory, here are some of the common features of antisocial personality disorder. Demonstrating no boundaries or regards for the right of others having no ability to tell between right and wrong, showing no signs of remorse or empathy when they've done something wrong, um, repeated lying, pathological lying, manipulating or harming others for personal gain, repeatedly breaking the law with no remorse, no regard for rules around safety or personal responsibility, being quick to get angry or overly sensitive when criticised. Again, I know I work in the business, right? But I assume that even to the layperson, this is really obvious that these personality traits are likely to predispose to offending. Somebody with a history of violence and a history of offending is more likely to commit violence. I mean, people already look at suspects previous offending history. So personally, I don't see where there is a role for offender profiling. And as I've shown you in the case of Rachel Nichol, it can actually be a hindrance to investigations. So I've told you emphatically what a forensic psychiatrist doesn't do. So what does a forensic psychiatrist does do, do? Absolutely nothing to do with solving crimes in any shape or form. Sorry Cracker, sorry Science of the Lambs, sorry Mindhunter, love you Cobra Kai. Now I could do an entire podcast on the job role of a forensic psychiatrist, but to very briefly summarize, Basically, we cover every aspect of offending that's related to mental illness from after a person with mental illness is arrested to their eventual release back into the community. During criminal trials, we assess people with mental illnesses or who are suspected of having mental illnesses and we separate the proverbial wheat from the chaff. And if they are acutely ill, we diagnose them. Equally important, we decide if they do not have a mental illness which sometimes involves defendants faking it. Again, I'll save that for another podcast episode. And if they're mentally ill, we make a judgment call on whether the symptoms were relevant to their crime or severe enough to reduce their criminal culpability, which is a topic I talked about in my very first episode. What I'm talking about is expert witness work during criminal trials. It's my personal passion and the area that I find the most fascinating. It's also the area where I currently do most of my work. So forensic psychiatrist experts help the courts decide where a defendant should go, whether that's a secure psychiatric prison or uh, sorry, a secure psychiatric hospital or prison. And we treat patients in both of these environments. And then after patients are discharged from hospital or released from prison, we supervise and continue treating them Uh, especially the ones that are the highest risk of committing violence or of reoffending. Okay, now back to the case uh, specifically about that two-year-old boy. As I said before, when I first heard the story of this senseless murder during my training to become a forensic psychiatrist, I wondered whether that kid would have remembered the event and would have been traumatised by it. Now, I didn't want to identify him now in this podcast because I thought it could be a bit... Um, disrespectful and kind of voyeuristic but I looked into it just for my own personal curiosity uh, 
And to my surprise, he's actually been on This Morning, which is like a, a morning TV show, discussing his memories of that fateful day and how it affected him. And the link is below this video. You should check it out. He really comes across to me as a very insightful and eloquent young man. Uh, if you check it out, you'll, you'll know what I mean. But I do think that this brings up a fascinating question, which is this. Would a two-year-old, he was almost three, would a two or three-year-old remember such a traumatic event and be affected by it? The answer, like most answers in the world of psychiatry, is maybe. So we have two kinds of memories. We have explicit memory, a kind of memory that deals with who, what, when, where, and how, and that comes online around the age of five. And then we also have implicit memory. That's the kind of memory that records feelings and emotions, and that's already mature at birth. So a child of two is very unlikely to remember the actual event. However, obviously, Rachel Nickel's son is the exception. And some people claim to remember events, traumatic or otherwise, much earlier than the age of five. But the feelings and the emotions, nevertheless, are stored in memory. And this can cause confusion for a toddler because they absorb like the negative feelings, but they have no understanding of where these emotions originate. So traumatic experience before the age of three can seriously disrupt a child's development, such as bonding with their parents, uh, language, mobility, physical and social skills, and managing their emotions. Babies and toddlers are helpless and they depend on their carers for a sense of safety and security. And they also feed off their carers' emotions, fears and neuroses. So if they're given emotional nurturing through loving and reassuring interactions, then they're more likely to cope and recover. Common reactions to trauma in babies and toddlers include unusually high levels of distress when they're separated from their parents or their primary carer, i.e. becoming clingy, or the opposite, seeming numb and not showing their feelings or seeing, seeming kind of distant from people and the events around them. And they can also lose their playfulness and their physical skills. Now, my heart goes out to Rachel Nickel's son and all of the family. I hope they're coping and I hope they've managed to somehow find some peace. And at the risk of sounding really patronising, just from the video clip, it appears to me that her son is has developed into a thoughtful and well-rounded person. <sighs> a bit morbid really, isn't it? Thinking about a toddler watching his mother get murdered and then raped. But as a forensic psychiatrist, I work in a morbid world. So I'd be really interested to know if anybody out there has had a traumatic experience before the age of five and if they can remember the events or not, and also how it affected them growing up. So please do get in touch and let me know.